This week on Socratic Cinema. I mean, okay, I'm kind of dumb. I didn't realize that she was supposed to be like passing as white at first in that first. <laughs> um, Irene, Irene, I mean, I didn't realize Irene was trying to pass too. Do you know what I, Brian and Clara rhymes with? Extramarital affair. <laughs> Listen, because the film, the film never shows you. <laughs> that was good. I was good. <laughs> this thing with Phil wasn't just like a random murder. Rather, this kid has killed before and has no qualms for <laughs> doing it again. Welcome back, everyone. Happy Black History Month. This is a special where I'm the only one that gets to talk. So my name is, <laughs> Car- <laughs> my name is Casey Clark. I'm Charlie Heatherly. <laughs> and I'm James Delicio. Hey, they're already breaking rules. Um, <laughs> We're sorry. <laughs> yeah, you should be. Anyways, I'm going to not... I'm going to try to not abuse them this entire uh, episode, but <laughs> while we wait <laughs> for that, you can see if you can hold me accountable. Try to hold me accountable. We know what month it is. <laughs> Ray Fisher, please. <laughs> Jeez, Casey's <laughs> off to the races. I know. This is payback for how stupid we yeah, usually are. Yeah. Names. <laughs> I've been <laughs> waiting, but <laughs> without further ado, this week we are jumping into the Netflix original called Passing, starring Ruth Nega and yes, what what? Put that. No one in. said. No one said anything. <laughs> no, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Who else is in the movie? How it's pronounced. And then Tessa Thompson is also the star. We have Alexander Skarsgård and then Andre. Um, the husband. Is yeah. it Andre the Husband? Andre the Giant, Andre the Husband. Andre Holland. <laughs> Andre the Wise. <laughs> Imagine if it was Andre 3000. That would be hilarious. But it isn't, sadly. No, sadly. no, no icons. <laughs> Dang. I'm going to shoot it over to James for initial thoughts. What did you think about the movie? You know, my favorite thing about passing is that it's time to thank our patrons for another month of supporting the Socratic Cinema Podcast. <laughs> oh, my bad. To all our patrons, no, it's fine. To all our patrons, <laughs> we want to extend, take this opportunity to extend a deep, warm thanks to you all for supporting the show, making it happen. So today, deep I want to give warm. my thanks. Yeah, deep and warm. Ugh. Lots of gratitude. John Delisio, Rachel Delisio, Lisa Delisio, Samuel Copeland, Ethan Rudder, Jeanette Clark, Heather, and Michael Clark. Mariah Helm, Peter Delisio, Roger Anderson, Christopher Heatherly, Salvador Reyes, and last but not least, Skullhammer Smash. The, the list is getting a little long. Wow, I this know, is like wow. we're prosper. Yeah, wow, live long and prosper. Wild. Yeah, thank you all thank so you much guys. for your support. We could not do this without you. Um, if you want to become a patron and have your name put on the list, you can do so at patreoncom Cinema for as little as one dollar a month. Your contributions enable us to keep watching movies and talking about them. Um, now on to passing. My favorite thing about passing. Hmm. What is my favorite thing about passing? I don't know. I really liked it. Uh, I, I enjoyed the movie. I think thematically, oh, this is great. This is excellent. I think there's a lot of also very fun filmmaking stuff going on here. I like the way they use mirrors in this movie is something I noticed. Um, I also think all of the lead performances are great. And if there's not like at least one actor slash actress nomination in here somewhere i think that is a mistake um but with all that being said uh i i didn't this like have my socks particularly knocked off you know like mm. i like every component of this movie but put all together i just i i wasn't like super enthralled or like wowed um mm. and it's not that it was a bad movie it was just like not incredible i don't know i don't know if that makes sense i um there's a lot that i liked and there's a lot to talk about but just on the whole i don't think it made for like a particularly wowza movie i i feel very like i'm a little mad at myself that i didn't like it more i guess um because i feel like there's a lot to like here but just overall i don't think it was more than the sum of its parts uh, if you know what i mean so i think <laughs> for passing um i would probably give it like like a seven, I think would be my my rating. Um, definitely recommend it though. I think it's a great, great, great little picture. Um, and it's it's not that short. It doesn't overstay its welcome at all. I mean, it's not that long. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's like an hour and forty minutes, so it's very, very digestible, very doable. Throw it on, great movie. You'll uh, you won't regret watching it. Huh. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Very <clears throat> interesting. 
Uh, how do you feel? I don't know how I feel. Uh, okay, so so <laughs> genuinely, after I watched Passing, I just sort of like sat in my room for 10 minutes, and the take that I came up with was that it feels like Passing is unstuck in time. Like, it's this weird look into a past that came out in just in 2021 and very obviously has 2021 actors in it and, and sensibilities, but at the same time is like talking about an issue in, in the way that was like most prominent back in the, you know, 20s or 30s or whenever the, the book was written, because this is based off of a, a 1929 book. Mm. So it just felt like, like I was watching a movie that was meant to come out like, like 60 years ago. Ah, interesting. And, and yet mm. I was seeing it now. And like all of the the visual components of the film are are incredibly striking and really, really great. The cinematography is wonderful. The lighting's wonderful. The blocking, all of that I think is is done really, really well. But I couldn't help but feel this movie treats its central theme of passing more like a novelty as the movie goes on. And it would almost be better as a short film rather than uh, an hour and a half feature. Hmm. So... Mm. It, it, like t to me just the concept of like oh look the the passing is black and white we make movie black and white hee <laughs> hee good metaphor like that just it feels weird to me and oh. I, I i sort of wish that they uh i don't know if they should have done it in color or not i think it was incredibly beautiful in black and white but the movie just for some reason didn't connect with me i think the performances were great i loved the subplot uh or or i guess no like the 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 way that uh, the affair sort of tied into it all and and how uh what's her name ruth nega how her character uh claire. goes yeah claire. claire i never remember the names how claire goes to <laughs> tessa thompson's character what's her name irene 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 how claire goes to rini as as like a source of of this blackness that she feels like she's lost because she's been passing as white for so long mm -hmm. and then that ties into this whole uh like a extramarital affair subplot like that's wonderful but it, it just it the movie left me in a very weird place that i don't really know mm. how to feel about and it's not like it did anything specifically wrong i just feel like probably stylistically this movie just didn't connect with me so yeah. i would personally mm. give it this is crazy that i'm saying this a six out of ten but i think oh. that this will speak to people in different ways and that you'll have to watch it and see which way it speaks to you in. Mm. I'm storing yeah. takes. Wow, wow. That's your first six out of 10, I think, Charlie. No I've given way. movies worse scores than six out yeah. of 10, no, but that's know, probably but my first six. Just yeah. not particularly six, got it. Just not, <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Wow, those are really, that's really interesting. I think for me, um, I, I agree with you guys on kind of like bits and pieces of your points i definitely feel like this is something that um <clears throat> if it would have come out in maybe like the the 50s or um whenever it's i'm assuming like it's set in the 20s 50s um I, I i'm no not clue. entirely sure uh sorry um it is set in the 20s the 20s okay in the 20s um that it would definitely be super self-aware and totally wouldn't get made in the 20s um <laughs> yeah and i feel so like eh, this would this would the office would never be able to get made now but yeah. it's not like it's not like that i just feel like <laughs> um the amount of self-awareness and the amount of like accountability and calling out different um like people just wouldn't have been widely accepted but that's one of the reasons why i liked the movie so much uh it was probably the most frustrating thing but also the most like compelling thing that none of the main characters i agreed with like a hundred percent yeah like, I couldn't yeah, back any, yeah. I couldn't back any of them like i could be backing the husband and then he would say something beyond stupid, just out of pocket beyond disrespectful. <laughs> like, come on <laughs> come on brian or even um like for me like claire claire uh, mm, the first time she came over to my house i would have kicked her out <laughs> <laughs> but i understand why she didn't and and even even rini like there's a lot of um uh, and a lot of the conflict between her and brian is that she's trying to 
um, like shelter their children. But mm. that's interesting because Brian is also like going into this extramarital affair with um, one of her friends that he like claims to detest. So none of them are really being honest or yeah. or anything with each other. Um, and we can get into some of the main themes and stuff later, you know, as we usually do. But overall, I would definitely watch the movie again. I would recommend it to someone. I feel like it's very much a uh, movie that would be on a like recommendation list for BSU or BSA. Um, like, oh, let's watch Passing or mm. Fruitvale Station or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. So and it, it is really, really beautiful. That was one of the the main things. I didn't mind it being in black and white. I did feel like it was like, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the metaphor kind of was a bit heavy handed in that way, but it didn't uh, be it wasn't detrimental to the experience for me. Um, but overall, I would I would give it around a, an eight point five. You know, going back to you my know, roots. you know, mm-hmm. I um I'd like to open this discussion on the on the black and white point actually because I think it's interesting that you both sort of felt um like ambivalent towards it because to me this was like oh black and white was a very smart creative choice here um because I I think it sort of adds a level I mean obviously there's there's the more heavy handed of like oh like it's all in black and white and passing and blah, blah, blah. But it it also sort of adds a, a layer of um, like ambiguity. I, I feel like with a, a, a subject matter, like, you know, p- trying to pass as white, there's a sort of instinct to be like, like, well, I want to see what they look like. Like, I want to judge for myself. And the mm-hmm. fact that the film is in black and white doesn't let you do that. Um, I think it adds a lot to it. Uh, and I think it sort of helps to sort of, uh, to demonstrate how, how everyone is sort of at these, different layers right like it's not such a yeah it's not such a uh, black and white thing eh? but um, <laughs> but, um I, I thought this was one of those examples where it's um black and white not for style but f- actually like to further the film's themes which is something uh you don't see all the time i think a lot of times modern movies throw on black and white just as an aesthetic choice um but i hear i think it was definitely like it would have had a major impact on the film had it been in color um oh, so i am i am definitely. pro pro black and white for passing i think that was the sensible choice yeah <laughs> well so specifically i think that there's two moments that this movie does very very well in black and white and that's the first shot uh <clears throat> sorry uh if you guys remember in the first shot it like is slowly focusing in on on the uh like sidewalk mm-hmm. and all of these colors are in grays and then you know, eventually you get to see, okay, the sidewalk's like white. Okay. That shoe's like black, the street's black. Like yeah, it it does Mm -hmm. such a good job of showing that ambiguity that you're talking about. And they really hold on that shot for like a long time as well. Like it's not just five seconds or something. It's like near 20 of, of just slowly zooming and getting you like deliberately prepared for the pacing and structure of this movie's like visual storytelling. Uh, And then I think the other moment that does it really well is also in the beginning when we get to see uh, Tessa Thompson, she's looking through her like white lace on her hat. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. at, at, at the moment that she is about to be, you know, like actually passing as a white woman in the movie when she meets uh, uh, the, the husband for the first time. And that's like just a really cool visual metaphor, I think, to, to sort of be seeing the world through this white view because she's passing in that moment. Uh, and I think that you could only sort of do that in black and white or have that register as powerfully uh, by using black and white. But I think just to expand on my point earlier, that the, the, the black and white, it, it feels like such a good stylistic choice, but I, I feel like it, it, it's a novelty that can out or, or that can outstay its welcome if, if you let it go on for too long. So I'm glad that the movie was only an hour and a half. Uh, instead of like two and a half hours for something like that. But it just feels like such a smart choice to tell a short version of this story with that very bold stylistic choice in a, in a short story or or in a short film. I don't know. Like I, I just kept, I just kept thinking back to that. I I think, I I think I'd see that. I think you um, bringing up the, the scene where Irene meets Claire's husband for the first time. I think that is a very, very like well done scene and and that is yes that's definitely one of those parts where it's like if that were in color i think a lot of the 
um, like enchantment or intrigue would have been gone because like when I was watching that scene, I mean, okay, I'm kind of dumb. I didn't realize that she was supposed to be like passing as white at first in that first. <laughs> um, Irene, Irene, I mean, I didn't realize Irene was trying to pass too. Yeah, so, yeah. so when I was watching that scene of them meeting, I was like, I was like, is this guy dumb? Like, can this guy not see that she's black? And if it were in color, that would have like taken away that element. But I think that layer of ambiguity um, adds a lot because the whole like you know message of the theme is that like it, it's all about identity, right? And what you're perceived mm -hmm. at and what you identify as. Um, like internally. So I, I think, you know, us being visual creatures, right? Kind of putting that dampener on our ability to make those like snap judgments, I think is very, very smart and forces you to think a lot deeper about identity and color in, in, in the film. So that was a yeah. very, very prime example, Charlie. And and even as Rini, like later on in the film, when she's talking to Hugh and he was like, oh my goodness, it's a black woman. How did you tell me? How do you tell? And like all that stuff. Like I feel <laughs> yeah. like it, um, that they make that a big point in the movie as well by making it black and white. Cause I knew from my experience, like there's a lot of focus, especially in the uh, cafe scene on Claire's like tights. And I, as someone who did a lot of like dance as a child and we were required to wear tights, it is very, very hard to find completely skin matching tights or tights that will completely like be uh, either like hide your legs if you're incredibly dark skin or if there's any sort of like waffling on whether or not like, okay, She's cream, so she's wearing cream tights. She's alabaster, so she's wearing alabaster tights. Like, there's a, there's a very uh, hard... Um, it's kind of like matching foundation, but with tights. So I feel like in that scene where um, Rini is looking at Claire's tights and she kind of smiles to herself, like, I interpreted that as, like, that was her moment of being like, okay, I might not be the only one that's pretending or that's like disguised in this mm. moment she didn't mm -hmm. necessarily recognize claire in that moment but she recognized the like difference and maybe like a tight shade and that's something where it's like okay yeah that makes sense to what she mm. described to hugh that it's not something that you can um necessarily like pin down like they're like all passing people or like mixed but uh white passing people are going to have this specific feature across the board that you can pinpoint and that's how you determine whether or not they have like if they're black like it's just certain like things like that and I just love how the movie includes like nuances like that I feel like all mm. of the characters which made them likable at points and then very unlikable at points <laughs> Um, it's because of the nuance that they were given. Like, no, like, you can't have, like, the one dark-skinned person and his dark-skinned sons always be um, in the right or always be in the wrong because of the, like, connotation of that when you're dealing with a topic such as passing. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a, a great point uh, that everyone is, is very... Uh, nothing in this film is black and white. Huh? Mm -hmm. But I'm just... <laughs> you can't do a joke like that two times and expect mm -hmm. us to mm -hmm. laugh both times. Yep, yep. yep. Nope. Another nope. another banger. Another banger from me. Um, James is like, this is the safest bit that I can do. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get a lot of mileage out of that one today. Um, uh, but I, I think it's also... You you mentioned that like this this would have been better served as a uh, short film. To me, it felt like a stage play. Yes, Ooh, yeah. I like this that take very too. Ma Rainey. It yeah. felt yeah, very Ma Rainey, very raisin in the sun. Um like just the way everything was blocked and written, I was like this is the stage. This is this is a play. Especially after watching um Tragedy of Macbeth, which is basically just a play that they pointed a camera at, right? Like that that it was literally all done in like a sound stage in LA. Like it was just I don't know if any of you guys have seen Tragedy of Macbeth, but that's the same thing where it's like this is blurring the line between theater and cinema. Uh, and and mm. I feel like Passing did something similar. Admittedly, Passing was a lot more movie-ish than um, Tragedy of Macbeth was, but but um, similar vibes. There's there's a sort of a, I guess that's a, a running theme here of, of this year of, of like really bringing the theater back into film. Um, so that was just something I noticed. Um, both of those films are also in black and white. 
I don't know if there's anything yeah. there. Um, but perhaps, uh, perhaps, perhaps best adapted screenplay nomination for passing. Hmm? Oh yes, yeah. How yeah. do we? How do we? Um, because me watching. Oh, it, you you cut out a bit. Oh, did I? Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> how do we feel about where this is going to land? Um, Oscar wise, nomination wise. Ooh. I, because mm. when I was watching it, I was like, this is a good movie, but I don't think it's going to get nominated. Not for Best Picture, certainly. Oh, it, no, not for Best Picture. If anything, I was like, if anything, maybe for sure costume design, um, even though in that like realm, there are going to be other movies that are going to blow it out of the water. Like yeah, I just feel like it's yeah. that type of movie where not enough people are going to understand it, that they're going to be like, well, we have to nominate it for something. And, yeah. See, yeah. to me, I, I, to me, I felt like it was very Oscar-y, but it wasn't a movie that I like particularly enjoyed. I sort of had like the opposite feelings. I, I don't think it'll get a Best Picture nomination. I think. No. I, don't I think, think so either. Tessa Thompson, Best Actress, maybe she got a. I think a like a BAFTA <sighs> nomination. I, um, I, I think that Ruth Nega is much better in this movie. Like, yeah, someone. Well. Yeah, one of the leads should get a nomination. Um, and I also yeah. think perhaps best adapted screenplay, but I don't think it'll win either. I agree with that. I think that of the movies that we've talked about so far for the Oscars, we've talked about the ones that are probably going to win stuff. So West Side Story, uh, we've talked about Power of the Dog. Yeah. Come on, come on, yeah. it's probably going to get some stuff. Like I it, need it, to see it, that one still. Belfast, uh, Licorice Pizza. Oh wait, not thirty ninety. Tick tick, tick boom. boom. Tick um, tick boom. Is is Macbeth gonna? Does that? Does that count as a best ad uh, an adapted screenplay? Uh, technically, yeah. I mean, technically, yeah. That might get. Uh, is there like best cinematography? Macbeth might get a nom for that. No, there's totally a best cinematography. I, I, it's, it's been a year since the last time we predicted these. I need to. Uh, That's oh, how yeah. the Oscars work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to need to refresh myself. Uh, no, but uh, yeah, I still need to see. Still need to see. Come on, come on. Also in black and white. What's Belfast going on? is also in black and white. What it's is going on here? Year of black and white, apparently. In the year 2021. What's yeah. going on? Um, I think I'm going to watch Nightmare Alley today, though. So oh, maybe yeah. that'll get yeah, something. That's on my, on my watch list as well. Um, I heard that's supposed to be good. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. but um, before we get into the rest of the episode, we're about, we're about, about 20 minutes in. I feel like this is a good time to dip our toes into the world of... You know what time it is. Come on. Hey, Finish man. it for me. What what time is it? It? Patron what? questions. <gasps> questions. What? Are there in a letter? In a oh. letter? What is this? Downton Abbey? I, I wasn't expecting <laughs> I that was... one. Oh, dang it. I was oh, was that your, like a transatlantic? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's no, it's okay. It's fine. It's all right. Next time. <laughs> Welcome. This is the part of the show where we answer questions from our patrons. Today we have. Two, count them, two questions. If you would like to have your, <laughs> one, two, if you would like to have your question read out on the show, you could become a patron at patreon.com slash Socratic Cinema. Socratic Cinema. Yeah, good job, good job. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, without further ado, let's get into our first question. What is your favorite black and white movie of all time? Bonus points if it's not The Lighthouse or Citizen Kane. This comes from one Chris Heatherly. Charlie, Ooh. what do you think? Uh, oh, okay. Man. Gotta be a Kurosawa film. Uh, if I can't choose Lighthouse, I love Lighthouse. Okay. Uh, and I think my favorite Kurosawa film currently is Rush uh, Damn. Oh, and, I'm gonna fight you. That, later. Well, like, okay. So I think that Seven Samurai is probably objectively his best movie. Like, it, it just is a masterpiece. But I like Rashomon because it is one of the rare examples of Kurosawa making a movie that is under two hours uh, and <laughs> that I think is really tight. I love the short story that it comes from, and I think that Kurosawa does a really good job at, at weaving together those different plots and those different perspectives into something that really makes you, like, wonder what actually happened, who actually murdered this woman. Uh, mm. my only gripe with the movie is that it ends on like a very optimistic high note, which I originally thought was a bad thing, but he does that in like literally every single movie. So I don't like, I, I need to watch it again with that knowledge in mind and see how it works. But yeah, he likes happy endings. He, he likes happy endings. Uh, it felt forced in, in this one, maybe like I, it, in fact, I thought it was 
meant to be like a twist and you weren't supposed to think it's a happy ending. And then my professor laughed in my face because he's like, I've never heard anyone say that before. Uh, But yeah, go watch Rashomon and a bunch of Kurosawa. All of them are pretty, pretty good. Casey, what's Mm. your favorite? I would say like the first one that comes to mind would be a To Kill a Mockingbird. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. But Ooh. The like, freshman year vibes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just because I don't think I've watched a ton of black and white film. It's which, not passing. I mean, I'd I'd love to. <laughs> I would love. To I'm watch sorry for interrupting. <laughs> I'm sorry for interrupting. I can't contain myself sometimes. <laughs> no, I would love to watch more uh, black and white film, but I think of the ones that I've watched so far, I do really like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. That's a great pick. I found out I have the same, uh, I took the MTBI, like 16 personalities test, and I found out, I'm not trying to brag, but I have the same type as Atticus Finch. Of course you do. Of course you do. That basically made my day. racist in the second one. (laughs) Yeah, um, (laughs) you know, my headcanon is that that one doesn't exist. Um, Yeah, a lot of people's headcanon is that that one doesn't exist. Listen, let me keep my white seat here, all right? (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, But my favorite... I'm tempted to be like, I like Roma the best, you know, because I love film bro answer. Alfonso Cuaron. I really liked Roma. Uh, French Dispatch comes to mind, but that has some shots in color, so I'm not counting it. But realistically, it's a wonderful life. Oh, probably. wait a minute. I'm oh. changing mine. Schindler's List. What the heck? Yep. What's wrong with yeah. you? Okay, there we yep. go. Sorry, sorry. No, yes, no, yeah, that's, 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 that's a great choice, James. Sorry. Yeah, I, I love, no, no, I was like, I was shocked that none of us said Schindler's List. No, but I, I love It's a Wonderful Life. That's probably my favorite black and white one. Uh, it's just just, just mm. a nice movie. Yeah, um, nice. Do you guys want another question? Yep. Yeah. All right, I got one on more. Me. Got one more in the bargain bin. This one comes from Heather and Michael Clark. <gasps> I wonder how, who they are. How I know about those guys? How about? What video game movie that has not been given a movie adaptation should get one, and why? Bonus points, who should star in the movie? Um, this, is a, this is a really hard, scary question. <laughs> um, I have an answer, but it's kind of like one of those, not a movie, but, you know, like, it's a, a, <laughs> it's a cheat answer. Okay, um, give your answer, give your answer. I want so badly... A Red Dead Redemption 2 HBO miniseries with each (laughs) chapter of the game getting its own season. I'm talking uh, like a six-season series. I don't know who I would cast as anyone because the character models are so iconic. I have no clue who who would play a good Arthur Morgan whatsoever. Um, But that is what I want. (laughs) Yeehaw! Yeah, I don't know. I have to think about casting. I don't don't think I'm going to earn any bonus points, but I want... I want Red Dead too. Is my voice glitchy right now? Nope, you're good. Okay, good. My bar, I got an orange bar and I was like worried. The um, orange bar of doom. Yeah, Red Dead 2 HBO miniseries. I guess if it had to be something that was like just contained in a single two hour movie, uh, I don't even know. I don't know. Uh, Kentucky Route Zero? Uh, no. Oh, no, that's a book. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who else who else has an answer. I, I I'm the game guy. I should have an answer, but you're the I, gamer. But I do. You uh, want me to stall, Charlie? No, I'll <laughs> I'll I'll put something down so that we can talk about it. Uh, God of War Ragnarok. Oh. Uh, or Fair. or just or just the new God of War. Either one of them, I think, would make great movies. They're sort of already movies. Yeah, God of War could probably be a a, a good action movie franchise. There was supposed to be a Legend of Zelda Netflix show, and then it got canceled. Boo! Thank God. That sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> it probably would have been horrible. God, um, what are they going to do next? A Mario movie? That'd be crazy. <laughs> oh, what a terrible idea. <laughs> mm-hmm. Take us home, Casey. All right, all right. So I don't play a lot of video games outside of fighting games, and all of the fighting games that I've played, they're, uh, they already have movies uh i would say prince of persia because i love just watching other people play that but they already struck out with that one i was gonna say (laughs) no second chances (laughs) what does come to mind is this uh this game that i haven't played but i watched a lot of gameplays of when i was younger which is beyond two souls Um, oh i've heard of that 
Which is, yeah, Elliot Page um, was like a motion capture model for their uh, main character. And I, I found it really, really interesting. It's about like this um, girl who has some sort of like, it's kind of like an entity that she's connected with telepathically and the entity is very... Uh, Mm, it, it just likes to kill people um, oh. through like protection. Like he, like the entity wants to protect uh, the main, uh, the main girl. Yeah. But it's also like the main girl trying to uh, like navigate what she wants versus what the entity wants. That's and, good. That's good yeah, movie and it, and it's really material. Good. And like, I, she yeah. ends up getting into like this like spy thing because the entity is very good at killing people. Oh. But, yeah, but she doesn't really want to be there. But it's, right. it's, it's, it was a, a great game. I could see that being a good movie. I, that also inspires me to throw Control into the ring. I think Control Ooh, Control would be good. Because Control <laughs> is not a... Okay. I didn't think Control was a very fun game, but I love the concept of it. So I think it'd be a good movie. Also, mm -hmm. maybe Firewatch. I don't oh, know. Okay. I think yeah, that no, could probably. be fun. That'd be very much like a like a solo performance piece, right? Because it's just it's just like two people. I, um I just like I, I think of those kinds of things and I just go, it's just a better game. It is a Firewatch is a better game. I think a control movie would be good though. Um It's just a better game. Like it's just, just all of them are better games. Yeah, maybe that's why they're games. Yeah, if you like this also goes for movies. If you make a triple A movie or a triple A game, you're making it because it is the best thing in that medium. Like you thought about that at least a little bit. You'd hope. You'd hope, right? And and sometimes you can get movies that would make great games because you want to play as as characters in them. Like Fast and Furious and Fast and Furious Crossroads, the famously good <laughs> Fast and Furious game. But I, I don't know. It's it's hard to get uh cinematic adaptations of certain games. And I'm glad we're getting some of them though. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. Uh, I think that's all for our, our Patreon questions. Thank you so much to all who asked. We hope you appreciate our answers. We hope you learned what you wanted to know when you asked those burning questions. If you have a burning question you want to ask, you know where to go. Patreon.com slash Socratic Cinema. It's the little things. Thank you. And uh, let's get back into the passing conversation. Passing Oops. back. Bloop, passing. passing it back. Do, 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 do. Okay. All right. All right. We're back. We're back. We're back. So I feel like there we can either jump into any hot takes that we have, or we can go through each character um, of the main like three ones being Claire, Rini, Brian, mm. um, and just kind of discuss how we reacted to them in the film, how they made us feel, or what we felt could have been changed or done better with their character. So which ones, guys, Can't, would you like to do? Can I drop a mini hot take real quick? This is super yeah. tiny. The ADR in this movie is god awful. Like, I don't know <laughs> I don't know if you guys oh. like heard it, but there are several moments in this movie where they have characters talking, but it's a shot of their back, and the ADR is the most stilted thing I have ever heard in my life. Yeah. And it, it, it was bad, and it was mostly in, like, the first 20 minutes of the movie, so I don't know why they decided to do all the ADR there, but it made the editing really choppy, too, because it just, it just none of it went together. It didn't right, feel natural like cut around at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, so, not as, it's, it's not the worst, though. I've seen worse in uh, The Revenant has takes the award for the worst ADR I've ever really? seen. Really? Because they had all of the, like, all of the Native American characters... At some point during production, they were just like, oh, shoot, we got the wrong language. We need them to speak an entirely no different language. Shot. And so they dubbed oh, over it. No. It doesn't oh, even look no. at all like their lips are moving. Yeah. But what wow. they did is they burned captions into the movie and they just banked on people looking more at the captions than at their mouths. That is <laughs> wow, but I I that's interesting because Charlie, when you said that, I was like, you know what? They probably had to do some reshots, and that's yeah. why they had to like. It, again, I wish that that's not my immediate uh like analysis or like assumption, but it's happened so much where it's like, oh, something's janky in the movie. Let me look up why, and it's like, oh, they had to reshoot it. It's like ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well yeah. and you can't do that during covid right, right so then you exactly. have to do adr and work with the footage that you have so i like 
I assume that they did the best that they possibly could. And like, if I was somebody on their production team, I would be happy with the effort that I made. Yeah. Uh, but it, it just felt a little, a little strange from a, a, a watcher's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I, I going into the characters, cause there's, there's a lot I, I want to ask about. Um, is it okay? Brian and Claire, what's going on? What's going on? Let's talk right. about it. Because yeah. okay, Let's here's talk the thing. about it. Do you know what I, Brian and Claire rhymes with? Extramarital affair. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, because the film, the film never shows you. <laughs> that was good. I was good. Let me just pause and give you kudos for that. <laughs> a, a big part of this movie to me is Irene's growing like paranoia. Um, specifically, there is this shot the first time Brian and Claire meet where she like comes down and she sees them talking in the mirror and it looks like they're standing super so close, close together. Yeah. And then the camera pans over and they're like a respectable distance apart. I thought that was so cool. That and then later, great shot. Yep. later in the film, they do the same thing and she sees them standing close together in the mirror and you're like, oh, haha. But then they actually are standing that close together. Um, and it's it's just a that's just such a cool like technique. I, I don't think I've ever seen like space mm. played with through mirrors that way. Very creative. But what? Yeah, let's let's talk because Brian and Claire's relationship is something that like I was a little confused by. I mean, very clearly Brian is like frustrated in his marriage, right? He's not feeling satisfied. I think that's clear in the film. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, is he Claire is giving him like excitement he's like living through claire because she's not facing the oppression that he faces as a black man um i think it's maybe a little bit of both right like what's going on because brian's whole thing is that he despises the conditions that that black people are in in america right he wants to leave and and so i've heard a lot of people saying that claire to him was like like a source of escapism like yeah escape. he saw claire as like freedom and he could sort of live through claire um I also thought it was interesting that for like the three times in the movie where Irene's like, oh no, you and Claire go out alone. It's fine. We never actually see them interact alone. Very mm. curious. Very Ooh. curious. Very strange. Yeah, I'm, I'm opening it up here because that's the end. It's, it's a lot to kind of take because for me, I there's a lot of like ambiguity in that situation. I feel like there's ambiguity yeah. between whether or not they are actually having an affair. I did find it very interesting that he wants to oh, switch up now that he wants to um, talk badly about Claire. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I feel like there's also something to be said about Hugh on a side note that Hugh's like, the classic um like that white character that even though he's in a position of power he's not a white savior and his most like prominent role is to police other black people on their he's blackness just, yeah he's the, the instigator film. he yeah. really is the yeah. instigator um and yeah so i feel like that could also contribute to why brian reacts to him the way that he does because of how much he is policing Claire and how much he's policing like Rini and just policing like black spaces because yeah. again he's like okay gentrification man get out of here um yeah <laughs> he's not a white savior he's just like he just has influence he's just there right yeah he's literally affluent and white and he's like well you gotta be nice to me <laughs> yeah yeah laughs um and he's never like he's never like outright racist either he's like he's it's like always coded he's yeah. microaggression you know mm -hmm. he, he has some pretty macro microaggressions yeah like, yeah yeah sure how, how can you tell like what the heck right dude? yeah mm -hmm. that is you know of course and even being super infatuated with Claire, but then finding out that she's black and no longer wanting to dance with her. That was also yeah. a Yeah, that's, that's a just, very, yeah. Um, Yikes. And I think, too, like, he probably has, like, he, he, as much as I dislike his character, they did give him a lot of, like, not necessarily expositional points, but just, like, 
like, oh, this is going to be the main point of the movie. Give it to Hugh. And so they had him, like, say it. And there's, like, essentially, like, this line about the fetishization of black men because especially, like, darker black men being like, oh, it's something. It's something new. It's something different. It's something Mm -hmm. outside of the norm. And then immediately seeing that uh, Claire gets super close with all of the dark-skinned people in Rini's life, like uh, Zelina and her husband and her kids, even though she, at the beginning of the movie, was like, oh, I thought you would have married whiter, and I'm surprised that your your kids are dark. And I knew, I knew that Rini was going to be married to, like, some, like, very, like, dark-skinned man. But for her to even, like, go and pursue that man, like, it definitely, it definitely has like all of the arrows leaning towards they're having some sort of affair or some yeah. sort of closeness that yeah. Rini is uncomfortable with, but doesn't want to say so. But I also think she doesn't want to shut Claire out. Yeah. I also think that line about like, oh, they like it because it's new and like exoticism. I think that sort of goes, uh, I mean, at least when I heard that line, I also read that as like going towards Claire as well. Like, mm-hmm. uh, Irene's family and her husband are interested in Claire because she is something new and it is sort of like a window into something that they've never experienced. So I think that line uh, sort of has like a double meaning. Um, I also, I, if anyone doesn't have any more thoughts on, on this point, I, I think- I have one more thought on the point. I would love to hear it. Okay, so what this part of the movie, this like trifecta of relationship is probably my favorite part. Because Brian, Irene, and Claire all have three very different and very interesting to analyze takes on, like, what it means to view whiteness as a black person. Like, yeah. Claire is coming from this point of view where she fully rejected her black identity and then became essentially, you know, de facto white and then realized, oh, that's not very fulfilling and is also really sort of racist and awful and I get treated horribly and if my husband ever found out, then, you know, super bad things would happen, like being pushed out of a window. Uh, so she tries to escape back to her black identity and and get away from the the fake white, the, the fake whiteness that she was cultivating. Brian seems to be very hyper-conscious of all of the the parts of his black identity that make him a target for attacks of racism and things like that, constantly talking mm-hmm. to the kids about lynchings. Uh, but at the same time, he doesn't want to deal with that. He wants to leave town. He doesn't want to mm-hmm. deal with that part of his black identity anymore, and you know, rightfully so. So he tries to escape through Claire. And then Irene is the one who tries to say, no, no, Claire, you can't, you can't pass as white. That's not bad. Where... Or, or, or that's very bad. But Irene, I think subconsciously by sort of denying all of the stuff that Brian keeps talking about, like even refusing to educate their children at all about that in, in any modicum, feels like she is trying to pass their family as white or, or, or take away that very realistic education. So all yeah. of them are, are hiding from their identity in some sort of way uh, or trying to reclaim their identity in some sort of way. And the way that that, interacts with the interpersonal conflict between the three characters is incredibly well done. I agree. Yeah. Great. Well said, Charlie. Well said. Thank you. Um, wow. Yeah. This is the last question that I have about the movie. Um, so this is the last thing on my little post-it note that I scribbled on. Did Irene kill Claire? Ooh. Uh, I think so. I, yes. I, absolutely. I think so. I think so. I, I, I wasn't 100% sure. I didn't, like, rewind the scene to watch because I was too caught up in what was happening. But I think so. I mean, I, I think her expression was more of, like, a, a guilt shock than a mm-hmm. shock shock. And and I think especially considering a few scenes earlier, the whole thing about the teapot, where she's like, I've been looking for a way to get rid of it. And it turned out all I had to do was break it. Break it, yeah. I oh, thought that, so true. I think that was a very, like, explicit tie-in. Um so I think she did kill Claire. I have I have something from a few episodes ago that I want to circle back to and provide to you guys for sampling. But first, I want to hear you guys' takes on on Irene killing Claire and what does that mean? Mm. I think even if it was accidental, it's still like there's still a lot of guilt because if Rini wasn't moping and pouting outside the window. The window wouldn't have been open. So there's guilt there. She was completely 
Um, uh, let's see. How do I? Okay, let's go to the beginning, like analysis of their relationship. As someone who is dark skin, even in situations where you might be with someone that's mixed, but that's lighter than you, you have this concept or this like idea of still being that dark skin or darker like sidekick or darker friend. Mm. And in that situation where Rini is constantly telling Claire that, oh, you are so like, she's always so gorgeous. She looks so good. She looks all this stuff, like very much highlighting her own insecurity and talking about like, oh, well, she's like, even if she doesn't really want Claire to go, she's like, oh yeah, she's like the life of the party. And she's essentially like diminishing herself to create more room for Claire. So in there's like another layer of not only jealousy, between her relationship with her uh, husband, jealousy with her um, stance or like influence being changed among her friends because now Claire's here. She's the newest like commodity. She's the newest person that's returned. Like she has all this like highlight on her and Rini's getting like pushed to the background or she's finding herself in this place where she thought that she escaped once she left grade school of being that sidekick character. At least this is what I, um, what I'm interpreting it as. So in that moment of even like, even if it was accidental, she didn't run down the stairs like everyone else to um, like look and try to help uh, Claire. And even when she came down, everyone was looking at her with this kind of, um, I don't know necessarily how to describe it, but they were very on edge. They were just waiting for her to say something, for her to enlighten the police on the uh the situation and even ruling Claire's death as death by misadventure is like perfect because this whole thing, like her whole venture back into her sense of blackness or black back <laughs> black into the black community, back into the black community is <sighs> can be considered dangerous. And that's what they were saying the entire time. Like, this is dangerous. Something bad can happen to you. But the bad was expected to come from her husband. And even, like, them not being able to hold the husband accountable outside of the room. Because when he was there, they're like, you're the only white man in here. Don't do anything stupid. And then as soon as they're talking to the police, like, oh, no, it was an accident. Like, we don't know if he pushed her. Like, Mm -hmm. she might have fell. Like, all this stuff. So they lose all autonomy. And so did Claire, in a sense. Like, she died because she wasn't satisfied and she didn't stay where she was. Like, she, it was completely a death by misadventure on multiple fronts. Dang. I mean... I mean, oh, yeah. snap. Good point alert. I was just going to say, <laughs> boring take if you think that the husband killed her. That's the lamest and most basic option. Yeah, no, it was it was Irene for sure, for sure. Irene um, or she committed suicide are, yeah. are the two that I oh, like. Oh, yeah, just stepped back, yeah. Do you want to hear something off the walls on the topic of, like, twist murders? Sure. sure. Do you remember a few episodes ago when we discussed one, Power of the Dog, a film yes. that revolves around the boy killing Phil. Well, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert for Power of the Dog. (laughs) I have had some conversations about this film since the release of that episode, and apparently someone presented the argument to me with such strong textual evidence that I cannot deny it. I have to rewatch the movie. They posited that I forgot the kid's name, but that the kid killed his dad too. And so that this thing with Phil wasn't just like a random murder. Rather, this kid has killed before and has no qualms <laughs> doing it again. Oh my Yo. God. Uh, Makes it, sense. It, it, always, yeah. it was like, it was in the beginning, they're like, oh, Pa died. The kid was the only witness. Pa says, I need Yo. to be kinder to people. I think the kid killed his dad. Uh, and I just wanted to let you all know about that. And I think it very mm. much changes my view of the movie, uh, knowing that. Because it makes it a lot better. It does make it yeah. a lot better. I wish there were a little more, like, 
clearer with that maybe. But that's a small thing. Um, yeah. But like I mentioned, I'm at the end of my list for passing. If anyone else has any final thoughts they'd like to say in passing before we wrap it up. I I, I think I have. I have one. Um, so <clears throat> I feel like in the day and age that we're in right now, there's always been conversations of, um, or at least conflict within the black community over uh, like people either telling other people within the in the community you're not black enough you're too white you're not white enough like very very hard for mixed people so and um dark-skinned people for other reasons like again it's a a, a <clears throat> it's a split that's been created by people outside of the community that's been essentially ruining the black community because of this like division and all this stuff mm. when watching passing i knew that passing was going to make me very uncomfortable and i it wasn't really at the top of my list to watch because i knew that it was going to either make me very angry or very sad but it was just a, a lot to kind of like sit on and chew on and this is what i came kind of came up with with the modern um uh, application of the theme passing in that conversation between Rini and Hugh taught when Rini is talking about how easy it is for um a black person to pass as white and how like difficult it would be for a white person to pass as black because of a cultural difference because the black culture is very like secluded and it's been purposely secluded uh, that it would be hard for a white person without, of course, you know, doing some sort of blackface to go and enter into the black community. I feel like now we're finding that it's way easier for black, for white people to enter black culture because of how readily available and not uh, exclusive black culture is. It's the main mm. culture. So even, but I feel like still what Rini is saying that there's still a difference of understanding in the culture i feel like that still rings true because you can do all of like this all of the like black fishing all of the using aav using all of the um new slang all of the predominantly black uh like hairstyles uh just anything in major media that has been drawn from black culture you can use that but you're never going to understand it on a uh like fundamental level and I feel like that's what Claire didn't understand and that's what she was trying to reach for is trying to come back and try to understand her blackness on a fundamental level and I just found it really interesting that nowadays we're kind of looking at the reverse so that that would be my last wow, that, that is a very take. good good closing good sync yeah or way to bring it into the modern age. <laughs> bravo! Bravo! Uh, it up a little bit. Oh, thank you. But <laughs> this has been another episode in the Oscars arc of Socratic Cinema. We are gearing up. You are not ready for the Oscars prediction episode. We are not ready for the Oscars yeah. prediction yeah. episode. I am trying to catch up so badly. Um, things are going to get off the off the chain when we start predicting Oscars and get all of them right you're not ready yeah but until then thank you so much for listening to another episode of the show if you liked it you can subscribe on youtube hit the bell so you never miss an episode hit the bell on your way out give it a like give it a comment let us know what you thought about passing you can follow us on spotify apple podcasts anywhere you listen to great podcasts so you never miss an episode give us a review on apple podcasts you can follow us on our social media so you can stay up to date with my hilarious viral tweets and our Instagram posts, we sometimes do polls and lots of just fun stuff. It's a great place to hang out and connect. You can find us on all major platforms. By that, I mean Instagram and Twitter, at Socratic underscore cinema and at Cinema Socratic. Um, and if you want to help us monetarily, if you feel so inclined to give, you can do that over at patreon.com slash Socratic Cinema. We also have PayPal. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I always feel weird doing that. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and uh, I hope you had fun. We had a lot of fun doing it. We're here for you. Whatever you need. <laughs> well, within not reason. 
and yeah, with like, oh, watch this video. Like that'd be reasonable. Or like watch this mm-hmm. movie. That's that's like well, that's within reason. Ask me um, to push a woman out the window. I'm probably not gonna do it. Yeah, but, yeah. It just unless depends. Unless she's cheating with. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Context yeah. matters. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for murder, context matters. <laughs> well, well, yes. <laughs> I'm not gonna take that one back. Um, until wow. then, be well, be kind to one another, and uh, be and, yourself. And be, be yourself. yourself. Reading rainbow. <laughs> Take We're out of here. Look. <laughs> We're out of here. Bye. Adios.